Bob Day, Senator, are you there? Yes, I am. Good morning, Jeremy. How are you, sir? Good, thanks. It was really good to hear Leon Biner's voice once again. Uh, yeah. I endorse your caller who said we miss him. Leon always gave me a, a fair go. Firm but fair, I think the... Uh, the, the, the catch phrase was well. The thing about Leon is that he's a pro, uh, uh, somebody with great, great experience, uh, and the and the industry seems to have turned its back on on that, which I would consider an absolutely enormous asset for well, any just, radio just, station. Yeah, just listening listening to him there this morning, he's still got a, a, a lot to offer. His <laughs> some of those insights into. Uh, oratory and uh, great speakers. My remember, my father used to tell me a story about a um, the speakers' corner that uh, that he mentioned, yeah. and a guy was heading down to speakers' corner, and my father said, where, "Where are you going?" He said, "I'm going down to listen to that guy on the speakers' corner," and he said, "But you don't believe anything that he says, do you?" And the guy says, "No, but he does." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was the attraction that people like to uh, listen to people and hear from people who actually do believe in something yeah. and have got something to say. And there's something particularly attractive about people who believe in something. Yeah, and so it's good to hear Leon, uh, Leon, Leon's voice. Yeah, and if you if, if you're if you're persistent and you really believe you've got something to contribute, you sharpen your talents, uh, not in front of an audience that is in agreement with you, you'll sharpen your talents uh, in front of an audience who probably want to kill you. Well, you asked um, Leon who were some of his great influences and my first thought of mine was was the great uh, Bert Kelly, the, the, the modest oh, member. Oh, yes, indeed. Now, Bert Kelly, there was a, there was a lone voice. Talk about a, a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Bert went into Parliament with, with his positions on on tariffs and protectionism and how the 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 farming community was being penalized by these um, tariffs and so on and for for 20 years he was the lone voice and black jack McEwen, who was the deputy prime minister um jack McEwen. and bert would uh get up and give his speeches all of which he wrote himself yep which uh, I'm sure you would, uh, would would agree with. And he said often after the parliamentary sessions or in the corridors, various members of the, the party would come up to, to Bert and whisper to him, we, we, you know, we really support you, but we believe in what you're saying, but we just can't say it publicly. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> because they fear for their uh, their position in the party. I mean, they yeah. were party room hacks, and uh, Bert stood up, and he won the debate after twenty years. Yeah. And eventually, it was um, Whitlam and then Hawke and and others that that realised that Bert Kelly was right, and um, hence the value of persistence. Yes, and it's wisdom and uh, honesty and all of those other things are not always glaringly obvious at the time. Uh, time oh. passes by and you get a certain perspective. Les Ellicus is uh, at the dining room table yeah, good too, morning, Bob. Bob and I think, oh, uh, hello just, again, Les. Yeah, good, good morning to, to you. Good to, good to talk to you. Uh, yeah, just uh, on Jeremy's uh, point, um, I think the problem with wisdom and knowledge is that a lot of our politicians of current era aren't using much of it. Uh, and we had Mike Smithson on earlier and he was speaking about the budget amongst other things, But and this is Stephen Mulligan's budget, and um, Mike was talking about the ramping issue and how that hasn't been solved and the need to create more beds. And um, he spoke about the era from COVID and I, I would like to take to the era back a lot further than COVID and probably even 20 years ago uh, maybe even longer, when the actuaries actually made the, the prediction that Australia's population is ageing and something has to be done with issues like accommodation, healthcare, you name it, all those uh, things that are essential to keep the, the population going. And not a great deal was done, in my view, along the journey to the point where 
uh, hospitals and even currently hospitals and centres are being, and you, and you being the person who's an industry expert, and I'll say this jokingly, Bob the Builder, because that's where you... you Bob you, the Builder. You were building <laughs> and you know, you know the industry well. There's a great number of uh, people, geriatric, older people, people who shouldn't be in hospitals, but they're occupying currently hospital beds because there's nowhere to put them. Um, and I think that is a problem, uh, Bob, and I'd like your comment on that. I think that's a problem that we just simply haven't currently addressed. Uh, I think absolutely, but I think Les, I think it's we're talking about a symptom of a problem rather than the actual illness. To to, to use a health uh, you know terminology, uh, the the unlike people like Bert Kelly and myself and others who had been in farming or industry or manufacturing, you know, like Tom Playford used to say, you know, build something, grow something, make something. Mm. Um, our current crop of uh, politicians um, reveal the fact that they've never been in in any kind of making, growing, or building kind of industry. So they don't really know uh, what 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 to do. Um, but why are they there? Days, why are they there, Bob? Well, why? because it, it's a career, and it, it is a. It's now become uh, an industry within itself. Politics yeah. has become an industry. They recruit people from university who go working for a politician and then they become the politician themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, back in our day, we, we used to um, study a dip, the, the right way and the wrong way to do anything. And there's a right way and a wrong way to run anything and everything. There's a right way and a wrong way to run a state mm. or a sports club or a, or a radio station. I remember a study on – there was a Chinese uh, city where, talking about health, their system was they only paid their doctors when the people were well. Ah, yes. <laughs> so if anyone got sick, then the doctors got you know, had their income reduced. <laughs> so the emphasis was on preventative, not – so to making sure that people didn't get sick. Today's system is entirely uh, built around the sicker people get, the more um, doctors get paid yeah. and the more demanding the health system becomes. But you see, that in a nutshell, you're absolutely right. We don't have a health system. We've got a sickness system. A sickness system. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, all, it's all geared for um, sickness rather than pre uh, uh, prevention. And um, like I said, there's a... <laughs> This is where the right way and the wrong way. The right way is where uh, people who understand how industries and um, health systems work rather than um, politicians and public servants who um, all they do is just keep doubling down and investing more and if it doesn't work or if the ramping uh, gets worse, they just keep pouring more and more and more money into mm. something um, we're, we're, I mean, the, the, the budget yesterday was a classic example. They're just going to keep pouring more and more money into it. The budget now is $30 billion, So the, the, the government is spending $30 billion. I remember when John Olson and Dean Brown were in office and the budget had hit double figures, I think, 10 or $12 billion. So every year, I mean, this is an old system where – as people get pay rises and income, they always spend more than their increase. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they could just contain the spending to uh, w what their current revenue is, um, then you're not going to keep ever increasing this debt. As Mike Smithen was saying, this $40 billion debt down yeah. the road – Who's going to pay for that? It's two billion a year in interest. But the problem, Bob, is that the, the it's not just here in South Australia, but it's national. It's around the world. There's an addiction to debt. There's no no addiction to actually creating wealth. It's an addiction to debt. Well, that's because it's somebody else's problem. They don't yeah. have to worry about it. Um, you mentioned it with Leon Biner the three levels of government: federal, state, and local. In a flash, I mean, once again, it's well known what's the best way to run a state or a country, um, and that is by um, uh, uh, 
having uh, decisions made as close to the people and as close to the action as possible. So therefore, that's why federalism and which, which level of government to remove, by far and away, the federal one. Reduce the size of federal. We've got a federal health department and a federal education department <laughs> that doesn't run a single school or a single hospital. That, that's that, yet, hasn't that dawned on anybody? <laughs> it does, but <laughs> once they once they're in those buildings and they've got a department of health and a department of education, then it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and um, uh, trying to break through that system. It's almost impossible. They, they've created an, th- these edifices that are so uh, big and so well protected that yeah. when some upstart um, interloper or, or some raw prawn like me comes along as a new senator and says, why are we um, spending umpteen billions of dollars on a federal Department of Education that doesn't run a single school, mm. then the barriers go up and and um, pretty soon you, you find yourself just on the outer. And, yeah. and isn't this the uh, propagation of the or- Orwellian philosophy that at the end of the day there's going to be no freedom of speech, no freedom of press, no freedom of assembly or association, and all these things are manifesting as we speak, Bob? It, it is. It's a fundamental difference in, in, in a worldview or a fundamental difference in belief in what is the best way to run society. Is it best to let people uh, run their own lives, run their own businesses, mm. become productive? Um, uh, like, like you said, Leslie, I come from the, the housing sector, which was basically run by uh, subbies, subcontractors, all these little guys all working for themselves uh, it was the most efficient industry in the world. Yeah. And I used to say, well, why can't we build cars like we build houses? Just have a whole lot of sabis, all sort of assembling. I mean, that's all a house is. It's just basically a, an assembly line mm. of parts and, and labour. Um, and yet one was the most inefficient in the world and the other was the most efficient in the world. And yet it was run by the same, basically the same people. Yeah. And it's because one is a top-down um, approach. Mm. Um, I mean, the car industry didn't leave because wages were too high. I mean, that was a factor. But it was because management wasn't allowed to run the factory. Unions uh, became Ooh, ran the factory, factory yeah, yeah, ran yeah. the factory, and the, the car the car company said, "No, we're not having that. Look, we'll pay the extra. We'll pay thousand dollars a week or more." Uh, for for the assembly line workers, yep. <clears throat> all right, we can do it for for three hundred dollars in China, but that's a small part. But what they couldn't countenance, and what they wouldn't countenance, was not being able to change shifts, not being able to change um, arrangements on the factory floor, yeah, rigid, and having to consult with the union every time they did something. So uh, basically, it's it's who who should be running the 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 state. Um, yep. Did you rather than yep, Bob? Did you see that story about the uh, uh, stop go or the lollipop people on a, a yes. union controlled construction yes. site? Over two hundred thousand dollars a mm. year they get paid for standing there turning a sign around. Yes, that's right. I mean, that, that indirectly a lot of that flows back to so again. It's control. The unions control it, and they the CFMEU. Yeah. We didn't. They they were able to control the commercial building sector because you, you get a, a multi-story building in the CBD every day that that stops. It's costing a million dollars. Whereas if they tried to stop a, a house being built, well, we just leave it for a day or a mm, week mm, or mm. a month. Bob, and it didn't make any difference to a lot of people. So it was the fact that they were able to uh, have this kind of um, uh, picket line um, hold over the commercial sector. And, of course, very few um, governments. I mean, John Howard once tried to do something on industrial relations um, to try to, to, to combat that. But once again, it's it's a it's a... Um, an institution, industrial relations, that's been set up over a hundred years, and it's it's massively strong. And now with the superannuation funds feeding yep. 
um, the the uh, the union movement. Um, they're just so powerful now. It's unstoppable. No one. It's yeah. unstoppable. Yeah, yeah. The genie's out of the bottle. I don't think we'll ever. But look, just on the John Howard thing, can I just put in a bit of a plug for, but and in defence of David Spears, um, look, David Spears. Um, I remember the front page of the bulletin, and I think you'll remember uh, this. I remember it um, well. And it said... Why do you bother or Howard, something? What, yeah, why does this man bother? Yeah. It was a picture of a bespectacled bes- um, John Howard with his big glasses in the 19, late 1980s. Yeah. And it said, Mr. 18%, why does this man bother? Yeah. And it's because, and you you read all the sort of thing. He doesn't cut through. He doesn't. He doesn't come across this. He doesn't. But he went on to become a very, very successful prime minister. Yes. So I would just encourage David Spears to hang in there. Don't worry about Mister Eighteen Percent. Why does this man bother? Kind of talk. Just keep holding the government to account. Keep talking about, and eventually. Um, people will not necessarily vote David Spears in, but they will vote uh, Peter Malinowskis out because, look, you know, I, 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 Peter Malinowskis is a very likable um, uh, person, a yeah. likable guy. I've met him a number of times. I get on well with him, but that's not why we hire him. We don't hire him. He's not a, um, a Hollywood actor. Um, uh, you know, we, we hire him there to fix the ramping, like he said. We hire him to fix um, and make the state prosperous. And again, he he likes to compare himself with Tom Playford. And I would suggest that if he if he wanted to compare himself and emulate a Tom Playford, then he would do what Tom Playford did, and that was be you know. Um, don't think you can have a top-down approach. Tom Playford built this state on, on cheap land and cheap water and cheap power, and um, and some would say also cheap labour. But there again, it's what the labour can buy, not so much um, what the actual dollar amount is. If you can have a good quality of life and a home of your own and and low commuting costs, but your wage is slightly less than interstate, well, so what? But that's not what he's doing. He, he's he's looking at um, a, um, a government-controlled approach, and that's not the way it works. And we've known from experience, Victoria is is going to be a, an example of that. Will be the first domino to fall. Yeah. South Australia is not heading in the right direction. It is not. It, it, we've known this for a hundred years. We've studied the right way and the wrong way to run a state and that's not the way to do it. My favourite Tom Playford story is that (coughs) the Premier's Department uh, in uh, Tom Playford's day consisted of three people. Uh, uh, Tom Playford was one. Uh, uh, Barbara, I think his uh, secretary, long-time secretary, was the other. And he had, Tom Playford that is, (coughs) had come back from the First World War and he had a batman during the war, and uh, that that uh, soldier had uh, lost his arm. And this this man was, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, Tom Playford's right hand, if you like, and he doubled as the doorman at Parliament Ooh. House. Now, the, the Premier's Department now, I don't know, I haven't Googled it lately, but I think it's probably 20,000 people. Mm. It's 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 out of control, and, well, and, and nobody the, you know, is trying you, to control it. Whenever you tr- uh, criticise the budget, the state government, of course, their immediate response is, "All right, how many um, nurses and teachers and police would you like to cut?" <laughs> it doesn't work like and, that. Bureaucrats. And you say, Look, that's only half. The, that's only half the budget. <laughs> yeah. What about all those media advisors? And what about all yes. the other hangers on? Uh, that's think, what we want. Uh, Why are we spending uh, money on absolutely. those? Absolutely. Think Tom Playford think... used. To, Tom Playford used to drive himself to and from. Mm. There's probably a, one thing that's going to save South Australia, Bob, and that's one word. And I'll put it into one word: uranium. The quicker well, we can get that a, out, yeah. that ore out of the ground and create a re- reactor here. And remember, Kevin Foley and Mike Rand said, they told the public, that was the narrative back when they were in government, that if we mine uranium and get a reactor going, we'll be the Monaco at this side of the planet. How true it could be. Bob, we've got to go, but thank you very much, and we need you back in Canberra, or we need you in North Terrace. 
<laughs> but where's the Norm Foster that's going to cross the floor and say, "No, we can have uh, we're going to have uranium mining." I mean, South Australia could could be a great um, uh, uh, base for that nuclear energy cycle. Oh but, God, um, yes. Mm. It's going to take leadership and courage. Um, as well, I say, there we, again, we, you know, you, you talk about. I remember there was a great story about Harry Truman. He 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 was in the First World War with um, uh, um, with, with his a guy called Eddie Jacobs. The two of them worked, and when they left the army, they started a haberdashery clothing kind of shop. Mm. And and Harry Truman got interested in politics and. And by accident, he ended up being uh, vice president under FDR. No one had ever heard of Harry Truman. That's where the Harry Who came from. Yeah. Um, and then when uh, FDR dropped dead, like three weeks after he was elected, yeah. um, suddenly Harry Truman becomes president. And his mate Eddie Jacobson said to him, now, Harry, now that you're president, Everyone is going to start telling you what a great man you are. <laughs> when you and I, when you and I both know you ain't. <laughs> oh, Bob, we've got to go. Thank you, Senator. All right. Cheers, Bob. No worries. Wonderful All to best. talk to you. Likewise. The great Bob Day.